Hello class, and thank you for joining me virtually. This week we are talking about the work of Edgar Allan Poe and Shirley Jackson, and we'll be talking about the genre of horror thriller. Um, so let's get started. The first piece that I had you read and listen along with today was The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. It is considered to be one of the um, seminal pieces of horror, especially in the American canon. Um, we already read A Dream Within a Dream by Edgar Allan Poe um, earlier when we were doing the question poems. So you already know that he has a background as a poet and as a critic um, and that he lived a lot of his life um, living a very sad life. You know, he lost his wife and his parents um, to tuberculosis or consumption. Um, and so this is one of those pieces of writing that really exhibits his um, his feelings of, as we say in the piece, nervousness and madness. Um, and so when we begin reading or listening to the Vincent Price recording that I hope you all got a chance to listen to, he starts with the word true. Nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? So it's really interesting to me that he starts with the word true because he spends so much time in this piece trying to prove to us that he is sane and that he is in total control of the situation that he's gotten himself in. But at the same time, as we read along, we start to find that he doesn't have that much control, right? He's actually been almost mesmerized by the old man's eye, which he thinks to be inherently evil. And so that whole beginning, he says, okay, how then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. So we have here on one hand madness and on the other hand, a kind of like nervousness that he doesn't attribute to madness. The narrator is saying that the nervousness just comes from a very, um, you know, natural place and that he's totally in control. He says then in the second paragraph, it is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. So what do you think? How does that apply to the idea of madness? Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. So here he's like trying to show that he is thinking through his actions. And even though there's this irrational fear of the eye, he says, I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. So that's describing this character who in this time period, you know, the Victorian time period in, in the United States, um, this might be, uh, you know, an old man who has some sort of you know, cataracts or some sort of illness in his eyes that's creating this filmy, kind of scary, off-putting image that the narrator is fixed upon. Um, he keeps returning to this idea of madness, right? In the third paragraph, he says, now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. So what exactly does that mean? You know, he's saying that the opposite of a madman is a fool, but in reality, there are a lot of people who are insane. You know, they're like psychopaths, right? Who are very well educated, who are very smart, and the madness within them, uh, it basically harnesses the intelligence to do bad things. So he's trying to create this, this um, opposition between these two ideas of madness and knowledge. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing what you think about that juxtaposition. And if you agree, do you think that madmen know nothing? Um, and do you think that smart people cannot become mad? Um, then he starts to describe his process on how he was coming to, um, you know, uh, follow through on this deed of attacking the old man. And so he goes first for seven nights and he opens the door just a crack and and we can assume they were living in a boarding house perhaps and that they lived together in this boarding house um so he opens the door just enough to fit his head through and then he has a lantern that he opens just enough that the light can fall directly on the old man's eye um 
Now, you see, he does this for seven nights, and he never gets around to fulfilling this deed, right? Um, and the biggest reason why is because the man is sleeping, and so his eyes are closed. So the object of the narrator's madness is not present. He doesn't follow through. Until so finally, um, and also let's not ignore the obvious that, you know, why do you think he turned that into a seven-day plight? seven days of him going at midnight to watch this old man and to look for a an opportunity um, to strike. He does it on the eighth day, and it actually happens by mistake because he makes a noise with the lantern and it wakes up the old man, right? He says, um, all of a sudden, he wakes up as if from a nightmare and he says, who's there? Um, so even though he is you know, um, even though he's going from this dream state then to hyper awareness, um, and even though he can't see the narrator, the narrator still like stays there for an entire hour without moving. So imagine the, um, the calmness and the control that this narrator must have in order to stay there for that long. It's actually quite impressive, um, given the fact that we're wondering if this guy is sane or not. Um, and just the way in which he's been very methodical about going through this process is pretty interesting. Um, back to the question of, is madness the same or the opposite of intelligence? You know, where does competence fall under these categories, right? A madman, can a madman be competent? Can an intelligent person be incompetent? Um, and then finally, we have... Um, we have this sudden burst of courage, which is brought on by the feeling of the old man's beating heart, which you can think of the man in this hour feeling the presence of another human being, getting more and more excitable and more and more worried. His heartbeat starts to become louder. It starts to become stronger, like a drum beat, right? So it's almost like that... Um, the, it increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. So he's invoking this wartime image to really show the heightened anxiety, the heightened sense of awareness that he has, and the, the kind of like compartmentalization that he's done. He doesn't hate the old man. He's already talked about this, but he hates the old, the, the vulture eye, the filmy blue eye so much that he's willing to take the love he has for the old man to the side to rid himself of this enemy, just like a soldier might, um, you know, have to attack another human being, not because they are malicious or murderers, but because that's just, you know, that's the, that's the job. That's the job that they've been tasked to do. Um, or in this case, this is the job that the narrator has, you know, it's a spell he's come under almost. And so he finally... Um, attacks the old man, you know, he says, the old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. So we have this, um, event where he finally kind of even invokes a war cry, a battle cry, and jumps into the old man's chamber and drags him to the floor and covers him with the bed. And the old man doesn't die right away. So at first it doesn't really bother him in this instant when it's happening. And once the deed is done, he then goes about hiding the evidence, right? Hiding the body in whatever way he seems fit. Um, so let's keep that in mind, that for right now, he says, um, I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. And that's true, right? The eye doesn't trouble him anymore. But what comes to trouble him by the end? We'll see. So then he comes back to this trope of madness again, right? He says, if still you think me mad, which... He just killed somebody for no reason, so that would probably lead the reader to think that he's kind of crazy, right? But if still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. 
And then all through the night, he talks about dismembering the body and hiding it under the floorboards in the old man's room. Um, so that's kind of like a, it's brilliant, right? It's the idea of hiding in plain sight. Um, not going too far or arousing suspicion. And even so, right after he does this, the officers, three officers come into the building because a neighbor had called about a disturbance. And so he opens the door and he, being the perpetrator, is the one talking to the officials. And, you know, that's why he says, you know, let me describe the wise precautions. Like he's talking about all the things that he did to try and get rid of any blame, get rid of any kind of evidence or any kind of nerves that might um, indicate to the officers that he was the offender. But it's interesting, right? He says in the beginning about, you know, he mentions that he was really nervous, dreadfully nervous, that he was and he still is. And so he's talking now about being very suave and very in control of the situation. But then all of a sudden, after he pulls the chairs and the stools literally on top of where the old man is, you know, for lack of a better word, where he's buried, um, it's not the vulture eye that is scaring him now. It's the um, beating of the heart, right? And so you have this really cool tension between... Um, the heart finally dying out, and then it's the sound of the heartbeat that truly drives him crazy. It's what makes him lose it, you know? So again, we have this idea of, of some sort of madness that can be controlled, but like all madness, like all insanity, it eventually will run out of steam. And, you know, he says, he starts hearing the heartbeat and then he says, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew, they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. So now it's not even just the heartbeat, it's the way that the officers are smiling at him and he thinks that they know more than they're letting on. So his paranoia, so it's not just madness now, it's also his nervousness and his paranoia are turning into this insurmountable, and by that I mean this this um, feeling that cannot be overcome. He can't hide it anymore. He says, I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart. So by the end, within, you know, perhaps an hour or so of, of committing this crime, he's already, uh, the guilt and I think the madness has already gotten to him and he feels like the need to, um, to confess and also to get out of these hypocritical smiles, these, these people that he assumes have a pretense to act like they don't know. But there's always the question, right? It sounds based on the writing that they really didn't know. So he just kind of blew his cover. Um, so what's really interesting about this piece in particular is you might see that it's relatively short. So we were just talking about flash fiction last week, right? This is something that uh, it has been considered a short story, but in the context of reading Kafka, this could also look like a piece of flash fiction. And it can also look like a monologue, like when we were talking about um, The, the Cloud and Trousers by Mayakovsky. Um, so something that really works for this piece is the monologue structure and the fact that there are so many unanswered questions, right? He begins by telling the story almost like we don't know where he is. And so the story starts with this conversation about madness, but we don't really know anything about this character. We don't know his occupation. We don't, we don't know his gender either, just to be clear, you know, Edgar Allan Poe wrote it so you can, you know, maybe make that assumption that this is a man, but there's not really necessarily any specific indication of his gender, of their gender, of um, social class, of um, any kind of background information. So it's kind of interesting that by withholding all of that information, it allows for the narrator to be really anything that the reader believes him or her to be. Um, the other thing that's really cool is by the end, so you have a pretense, you have a, um, 
crime, you have the lead up to the crime, and then you also have this confession, right? And so it's interesting also that you have this, um, it's almost like a little bit like a crime story, which Edgar Allan Poe is also um, credited with writing the first detective story, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, especially when you look at how this story progresses. Um, another thing that I really enjoy in this story is you have the specific attention on the evil eye, right? So you have the evil eye as a, um, a symbol in, um, in a lot of cultures that it's just about like this evil spell that can be done on you um, and you know your desire to protect yourself from that. So there might be some reference to that um, cultural idea. But the other thing is that you basically have this one item, this one thing that is making the narrator crazy. So one prompt that you could do is have a narrator who is fixated on one characteristic of someone or on one item in a house or in a store or a street. Like pick one thing that the narrator is in a way obsessed with, either in a normal way or an abnormal way, and just play with what the narrator thinks and where he goes. And, um, you know, is this item something that could create some sort of madness, that can create um, a situation where the narrator has to jump to do something, has to, you know, has no more control over themselves because of the obsession. Um, another thing I really like is that you don't really have that much dialogue from any of the characters. It's really mostly monologue. And then you have the old man saying, who's there? You have the um, narrator at the very end saying, villains, dissemble no more, I admit the deed, etc." So this is a technique that Poe is using in order to show us that this entire story is happening in the mind of the narrator. And so I have that question on the discussion board where I ask you, do you think that the narrator is sane? Um, and I ask you that because there are plenty of arguments that say he is, you know, he did something bad and then his conscious conscience tells him that he has to atone for that, right? Um, but then there are plenty of um, arguments to be made as to why he's exhibiting a pretty erratic and mad behavior. Um, and so withholding on uh, dialogue from other characters really does suspend that question even more because anything that's happening in your mind or in the narrator's mind lives in that world, right? And we often look at dialogue with other characters to, to show us how does this narrator interact with the rest of the world. And so we don't have that much of it here, but we have a whole lot of actions. Um, and that too, the whole thing with like, in his mind, he's saying, I'm not crazy, but his actions, are they saying the same thing or not? Okay, so let's move on to The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. Um, this is a really famous story. I'm sure that many of you have already read it. Um, so let's dive in. Um, so this is a long kind of drawn out opening where it's just describing the town. And, um, you know, it's June 27th, clear and sunny with the fresh warmth of a full summer day. The flowers were blossoming profusely and the grass was richly green. And so she starts off with a really picturesque description of the setting. And we start to, you know, learn more about the town. We have the children assembling outside of school. Um, because school is closed, and you have all of these, you know, boys collecting rocks, which is, you know, pretty normal um, behavior for little kids to just collect things from the floor. And you have people that are beginning to gather around the town square for this annual event called the lottery. And so um, there's a lot of attention in the beginning talking about the lottery. So we say the lottery was conducted as were the square dances, the teenage club, the Halloween program by Mr. Summers, who had time and energy to devote to civic activities. Um, and so you have, you know, the grouping of the lottery with events such as square dances, teenage clubs, and Halloween program, which are all pretty, you know, they sound pretty fun. So 
our first impression of what the lottery is, is that it might be a positive thing. It might be something that's fun. And given what we understand of a lottery to be, we might think, oh, there must be a prize. There must be some cash involved with winning the lottery, right? So what Shirley Jackson does so well is that she sets up this expectation and then pushes back against it, as we will find out. After talking about the lottery and talking about, you know, where it comes from, it's a, a tradition that started at the beginning of the history of this town. So it's something that's really um, particular and something that's very special to, to, the, to the culture of this time and place. Um, Jackson also spends a lot of time talking about the black box. Um, and so I'd like to ask you, why do, why do you think she does that? Why does she spend a couple of paragraphs just talking about what the box looks like, the conversation about having a new box, and maybe this box was made from the remnants of an old box? Like, why would she put all of this attention onto the black box? Um, and furthermore, the desire of the townsfolk to not replace it with a new one. And how does that fit into the idea of tradition? Um, we then have, you know, more characters that come into play. We have Mr. Summers, we have Mr. Martin, we have Mr. Graves, we have Mr. Hutchinson and all of their, you know, wives and kids. And they're all getting summoned up to get ready for this grocery, this, um, excuse me, this lottery. Um, and something I really like as well is you have, um, so we have Mrs. Hutchinson who was at home doing some stuff uh, around the house and then we have her here showing up late and then rushing to the front of the crowd to meet with her family. So this is acting a little bit like foreshadowing, right? By not making sure that she attended this event on time, it's almost like she's welcoming negativity into her well-being or into her life right which we find out uh as the story goes on she's the most nervous so we have this idea of nervousness again in this story as well as in Poe's story um so nerves are a really great thing to use when you're writing about horror and thriller because if you have characters in the story that are feeling nervous that inherently does something to the reader that makes them nervous as well you know it's just a, a natural human instinct i think to to have heightened awareness when somebody else seems to be kind of tweaking out. So that's another really great um, tool to use when you're writing your uh, short story, your horror thriller. Um, and so then again, we also have um, finally the beginning of the lottery. And so each of the, you know, 200 or so people in the town grab a piece of paper from the black box. And then once everyone has a piece of paper, everyone opens it at the same time. And that's when it is revealed who has gotten the one piece of paper that's different than all the others. And so it finally comes out then that Mr. Hutchinson has won the lottery. Um, but then we find out that's not the only round. That's just the first round. And so after the Hutchinson family has been distinguished amongst um, all of the other ones, the next round of the lottery is to give each of them a piece of paper. And so one of them will win the lottery. And as it turns out, um, the person who has been the most vocal about being against the lottery, um, the person who has been the most nervous, who shows up late on the day of the lottery, is the one who ultimately wins. And notice she keeps on saying, you know, it's not right, it's not fair, and there's murmuring as, as the tension comes up about, you know, other towns which are either talking about getting rid of the lottery or have already gotten rid of the lottery, to which Mr. Summers, who's the, like, old man who, in a lot of ways in this story, represents a, like, old-timey patriarchal um, social group, um, he's the one who says, you know, these young people don't respect tradition. And so 
we're still not sure about what is happening with this lottery, what really is the prize, but we know that there's this conversation happening about tradition and why it's important to preserve it, but then also questions of, well, if people change over time, doesn't that require us to change our traditions over time to reflect the new views and the new you know, generations of people? So that's kind of the social commentary that this story is making. But then, finally, we have this moment where all of a sudden um, it's Mrs. Hutchinson, right? And we understand that she has won the lottery and she starts kind of yelling a little bit in a crazy manner. You know, she keeps on repeating, this isn't right, this isn't fair, there was not enough time for us to pick. And so she feels not only does she feel gypped, but I think she also feels really, really scared about what's about to happen. So that's a way that Jackson is withholding information, but then building suspense around these characters because of Mrs. Hutchinson's, you know, her reaction to winning is really, really negative. It's really anxious. And, you know, she's basically kicking and screaming. So this is one of those moments where it becomes very, very clear to the reader that the lottery is not actually a positive thing. And whatever it is that she's won, she has no desire to claim it. She has no desire to have it. Then what happens is um, we have the um, people who begin then to form a crowd around her, right? And Mr. Summer says, all right, folks, let's finish quickly. So this almost seems like, all right, are they gonna prank her? Or like, what's gonna, what's happening? Why are they forming a crowd around her? Um, and the, the next line says, although the villagers had forgotten the ritual and lost the original black box, they still remembered to use stones. So that goes back to the very first, uh, occurrence where the little boys were picking up stones from the ground, right? That originally came off as just a very ordinary um, action that probably if this is the first time that you're reading this, you didn't think anything of it. But now with the context you have, oh, okay, so they still remembered to use stones. The pile of stones the boys had made earlier was ready. There were stones on the ground with the blowing scraps of paper that had come out of the box. Mrs. Delacroix selected a stone so large she had to pick it up with both hands and turn to Mrs. Dunbar. Come on, she said, hurry up. And let's remember Mrs. Delacroix and Mrs. Dunbar were people who were kind of egging her on earlier. They, they were saying, oh, Tessie, it'll be fine. Go girl, there's a good girl, you know? So it's kind of, I mean, to me, a little bit heartbreaking, right? That they not only they not only start chiming in to this activity, but Mrs. Delacroix selected a stone so large she had to pick it up with both hands. So she's like going full in to this activity, which we by and by understand um, just by inference, right? It isn't fair, it isn't right, Mrs. Hutchinson screamed, and then they were upon her. So it can be... Um, very clearly understood that whoever wins this lottery in this town gets stoned. Um, and, you know, it's, it's terrifying because you think about like, all right, well, if this is a tradition that's happening in this town, it isn't too much of a stretch to ask ourselves, are there other traditions that we are um, holding on to that maybe aren't so positive? And what is the problem with people holding on to the ways things were rather than embracing how things could be? It really looks like from most of the story that most people in this town are not enthusiastic about this tradition, but none of them are courageous enough um, or determined enough to go against Mr. Summers, to go against tradition, even though there are other towns who have already been um, pushing against this tradition um, to get rid of the lottery. Um, so I ask you a question on the discussion board, which is, when was the moment that you realized that something was off about the lottery? And so I want you to give a specific line from the story and to tell me why that was the biggest hint to you um, that something was um, afoot. 
And also, I'd like to ask you the question of, do you think it is fair? Um, what do, exactly does it mean to be fair? You know, if you're in a society here where, you know, everyone basically has the same odds, you know, it's a one in 200 chance, is it really unfair that she gets chosen? Or is, is she saying it's just unfair that this is something that we have to do? And maybe it's something she doesn't understand. Um, another really cool moment that I like is early on where the characters are talking about the last lottery and they're saying, you know, it feels like the last lottery was just a couple weeks ago. And so by the end of it, when you realize what happens at the end of the lottery, it really makes you think like, that's true. In a year, you know, every year they're going to be assassinating one member of their community. I mean, I wonder how that fits into their small number of 200 people. Um, how does that fit into when children are just as um, susceptible to winning the lottery as um, adults are and as the elderly are, right? So in a way, maybe it really is fair that everybody is included. You know, no one is exempt from this frightful tradition. And so um, for your second prompt idea, what I'd like to offer is you can write a short story in which you take a very normal event or maybe even a positive event and try to find um, a way to make it negative and really like hold out on the information. So the same way that Shirley Jackson is talking about a lottery, which we tend to think of as a positive thing, like winning the lottery is life changing in a good way. She made it that it is life ending, right? So are there other kinds of events that you can think of? Maybe like, you know, like, like, uh, going to a sporting event or, or a competition. Um, it kind of makes me think about in the past, there have been athletes who have gone to the Olympics that if they lose, when they get back to their host countries, they're tortured or killed. Right. So taking something that has a really optimistic and kind of positive, um, cultural significance and challenging it with flipping it on its head would be a really interesting um, premise for a story. Um, and so as we see from these two stories, the things that are the most effective with horror are um, stimulating the reader's imagination and really giving them um, that sense like a sense of security and then also a sense of dread. By putting them together, that makes it really effective because Feeling scared or nervous after being lulled into a sense, a false sense of security, it gives it that much of a punch, that much more of a punch, um, I should say. And the same way that you can um, do that, you can also withhold information. So you can talk about something in kind of general terms, like the way that Sh uh, Shirley Jackson was talking about the lottery, and then withhold the information of what actually happens at this lottery until the very end. Um, the third prompt I'd like to offer you is, well, I mean, it cannot be denied that the world is very strange right now. At least in New York, we have, you know, we have to wait in line at grocery stores for a couple of, let's say, 10 minutes. And then you walk in and some shelves are empty and, you know, it's very empty everywhere. And so um, using our current social and cultural moment, um, could also be a really great backdrop for a horror thriller story. Um, you could go into the realm of vampire zombies, um, ghosts. A ghost story is always an amazing thing. Um, monsters, so like, you know, the story of Frankenstein was, for example, written in the night um, just as a, as a um, challenge. So any of these realms of horror and thriller, you are welcome to immerse yourself in for your creative writing assignment. Okay, thanks everybody for watching and I'll see you next week.